RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers, we are in the Swindon Museum of Computing today for a very special show and tell. Hopefully not the last, because um, they've been very kind, uh, stupid some might say, in giving us the keys and giving us access to the museum. And when I say we, I'm joined today by Keith from YouTube channel The Digital Orphanage. And uh, Keith, welcome, you're also a volunteer here, aren't you? I am, Neil. I've started volunteering. Uh, this is a not-for-profit organisation and uh, they rely on volunteers. So it was great for them to give us the key. Mm -hmm. So here we are. Here we are. We've got free reign. Uh, and we thought, well, where do we start when there's so much to show and so much to tell you about? So we came up with the idea that we'd start with some common ground. Um, because hopefully this won't be the last video that we make I, here. I if things not. go to plan, we'll have access to everything. So let's start with some common ground. And um, we found out that for us, that was the Amstrad CPC, wasn't it? The 464. It was. Um, so for me, it was my second computer. Uh, it was the family's computer, the 464. Uh, I had a ZX81 before, um, but Neil, that was your It was first my very computer. first micro, was the CPC 464 back in, I think, 1985. I got it Christmas 1985, laid out on the table. Um, it wasn't wrapped. I have my suspicions that my dad was playing it until three or four in the morning before I got my hands on it. So, um, but it was a very exciting machine for me, and that was my introduction to the world of computers. But we don't want to show you these through the, uh, the glass of a cabinet. We're going to clear the table here. We're going to find as many CPCs as we can. But first, we need to go down into the vault. We need to dig them out. It's time for some digital archaeology. Have you got your hat? I've come prepared, Neil. Let's, Let's see what we can find. Let's go. <laughs> Here it is, my very first computer. It's actually really nice to see the whole range laid out. Um, I only ever owned the 464, and we've got a very rare example in the 664. They're really hard to come by. Mm. 6128's appeared on my channel. I don't know if you've covered it on your channel. Have you covered not any yet. Amstrad stuff? Not, no, not yet. Do you plan to? I do. I was planning to work through in the order, so uh, yeah. I, you know, it's one of my ones coming up. Yeah, so you'd be starting with the with the 464. Um, and don't worry, if you've been watching the Mega PC series, Alan is not here with us today, Alan Sugar, <laughs> to berate us. But um, yeah, the 464, so um, what do you know about this, Keith, technically? Indeed, it's 64K. It's got a Zilog Z80A processor uh, running at 4 megahertz, but because of the way it works with the uh, video controller, it had an effective rate of about 3.3 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Its competition here in the UK at the time would have been the ZX Spectrum, uh, the Commodore 64. Yes, the pregnant calculator, the Spectrum, <laughs> as uh, uh, Alan Sugar once said. And one of the main things I think he wanted was to have a full travel keyboard because obviously the main competition in the Spectrum didn't have that. Yeah, and there are two examples of the keyboard, aren't there? So this is a, a lower profile keyboard? Indeed. So my one was what I've seen called since the big key, uh, so the taller keycaps, uh, but later ones had these slimmer keycaps. Okay, so for whatever reason, probably cost cutting, they went to a lower profile. Um, Certainly less plastic. Now of all the 8-bit micros that I've had my hands on, this is the widest of them all, the girthiest of the 8-bit <laughs> micros. This is absolutely huge. Uh, of course you've got the built-in tape deck there, but you may have expanded on that with the FD1 floppy drive and there's another interface device there, isn't there? Sure, so it came with the DD1 for those who had the 464. Yeah. Uh, and that contains the missing firmware to control and, and the hardware to control the floppy drive. Yeah, so uh, that and slots that onto the slots back. Slots there. onto the back. There's no th through connector on this one, so that always had to go right on the back. Yeah. Uh, and it came with, for example, Harrier Attack, Bridget. There was this big pack. Can you remember how many games there were? Well, 
funnily enough, there were oh, 12. Oh, you've, you've got them all. And I have them all here. So they weren't presented like this. They were presented in one big cellophane square, weren't they? Yes, it was. Uh, the one we had was a, uh, a cardboard sleeve. OK. Um, so that, that's now long since gone. But it came with all of these. And Amstrad got it right in that they understood that this was going to be bought by parents for their children. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want their children just playing games they wanted them to do other things so you had a word processor you had some educational software in so there i'll just well. pull out the software that we didn't play <laughs> animal vegetable mineral time man one um what was the other one? Oh, you got the word processor there now i used that because we had a printer um, my dad got a printer with it the amstrad official amstrad printer so i did my secondary school homework on one of these as well yeah yeah well for me it was harrier attack Love that game. Um, and Bridget here, this is the only game that my mother has ever played in the history of video games. Wow. So when she sees stories on the news about, um, I don't know, events that have happened and supposedly been influenced by video games, that's, that's her, her point of, of reference. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Bridget is the cause of all evil. Um, somebody's paid £7.95 wow. for Bridget. Some madman. Um, and it even says on the inside. Not for resale, given free. So whoever paid £8 for Bridget, you're a lunatic, sir, or madam. And, of course, one of the characters that it introduced was um, Roland. Mm -hmm. um, and after named after Roland Perry, I believe, uh, the designer. Of yes, he was one of two designers, wasn't he? Well, I believe uh, they hired what they called, uh, in their words, uh, a couple of hippies <laughs> who said they could create a computer uh, in a month. And uh, they went off and then couldn't deliver because who, who could deliver a computer in a month? Uh, but the pressure was piled on uh, and I believe uh, one of them even kind of went missing yes. for a while. Yeah, got completely burnt out and I think his yes. dad actually found him exhausted on the floor, packed him up and sent him away right. to a retreat to recover. Um, yeah, so I think Alan perhaps thought he'd found the next Steve Wozniak's and Jobs um, and didn't quite get it right. So, um, yeah, this chap Roland stepped in, didn't he? He did. And uh, I don't think it was his idea, though, to change it to a Z80, though. I believe the people they went to to get the firmware uh, had uh, already got it working for the Z80 add-on for the BBC. Mm -hmm. And they suggested, well, rather than us change it, why don't you turn your design into a Z80? Uh, and I believe that's what's happened. Right, right. And um, you had the choice when you bought it of a green screen or a colour monitor. Were you a green screen peasant or did no. you have the colour monitor? <laughs> Thankfully, my parents had the foresight to get the colour monitor. Yeah, yeah, I had the colour monitor too. And um, uh, part of the reasoning for that was not only to make a bit more money, I'm sure, but also uh, Alan Sugar in his marketing thought, well, the kids should be able to play the games without interrupting the parents' television schedule. So he thought it was quite essential for it to come with a, tele with, with a monitor. And it worked well because I would spend many hours in front of one of these uh, whilst my parents were watching TV. Mm -hmm. so. um, An interesting design in that the power feeds through the monitor, doesn't it? So you only ever had to plug one plug in. Uh, that powered the monitor, which in turn then powered the uh, CPC, didn't it? Yes, Amstrad wanted the machine to be very easy to plug in, only wanted one cable, uh, didn't want people hunting around for all different cables and sockets. So one power connector and then on the earlier monitor that came with the Amstrad 464, uh, it only gave five volts to the computer. And then what we have here is a, the later one that came out when the 664 was produced that has the extra 12 volt for the floppy drive. And that does bring us on nicely to the next machine, the 664. But before we talk about that, there's one that should be mentioned quickly, the lesser known CPC 472. Correct. Available uh, for one month in Spain. Indeed. <laughs> and I've never seen one for sale, actually. I'd love to get a hold of one for the collection. Um, but the, the reason the 472 existed was because of uh, tax um, uh, penalties in Spain, wasn't it? Yes, they were trying to the Spanish government to uh, encourage their own homegrown uh, computing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that was a time when uh, there was a deal between Dragon and a company over in Spain. Mm, Eurohard, I think it was, mm, yeah. To, yeah. To produce one. So the Spanish government were trying to encourage their uh, own homegrown computers. So then the 472 
was designed to get around that tax. Mm -hmm. So the 7.2 in 472, 72K. Mm -hmm. um, so the tax was applied to any computer that didn't have the, the N with the tilde above it, so the Spanish N from the mm -hmm. Spanish alphabet, uh, and any computer with less than 64K. So what Amstrad did was they put an extra eight, seven kilobytes? No, it was eight, eight, eight kilobytes. Eight kilobytes. Sorry, kilobytes. My maths is terrible. Isn't it? <laughs> and another eight kilobytes on a daughter board in a 464 that wasn't electrically connected in any way whatsoever. It was it doing nothing. No. But they could then avoid the tax. Uh, and then a month later, Amstrad added the N with the tilde. I'm sure there's a proper name for that character. N with the tilde to the keyboard. And that was it. They didn't need to produce it anymore. So if you ever see an Amstrad 472, grab it quickly, because that's a very collectible machine. Uh, more collectible uh, than this, which is in itself a rare machine, the CPC664. When did this one hit the shops, Keith? Uh, now, from my research, this hit the shelves around about May-June time uh, of 1985. Okay. So we're talking about uh, a good year later than the six, uh, 464. Mm -hmm. And this was based on some feedback from 464 owners who said, it would be nice to have a bit more RAM as standard. It would be nice to have a disk drive. And Amstrad, well, the easier of those two was to add the disk drive. So that's what they've done in this model. The same amount of RAM, the same 64K. Indeed. And the addition of a disk drive. And you told me earlier that it had an interesting code name during development. Yes, apparently it had the code name of IDIOT. <laughs> which stands for? Which stands for includes disk instead of tape. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, you could plug a tape drive into it if you needed to. Uh, is there a cassette yes, port? Yes, I believe it's Yes, on. there is. There's a cassette port here. Yes. So if you really wanted to access, if you'd upgraded and you needed to access your tape library still, you could plug in an external tape drive. But why would you when you had a nice, fast, floppy disk drive? But Amstrad being Amstrad, they had to do it differently, didn't they? It's not a three and a half inch floppy as was becoming popular at the time. It's a three inch floppy. Indeed. Um, here's an example of a three inch floppy. Uh, the same as the 6128 model, that the later model has the same disks. And the uh, Tatung Einstein had the same disks and some other CPM. So whether it was because a lot of CPM style machines had these disks, right. uh, or whether there was always a story that Amstrad had a good deal on them. So which yeah. of the two, I'm not sure. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Amstrad had a bit of a monopoly on the disks. Um, but yeah, they're, they're so much quicker than the tapes, as, as with any 8-bit micro, when you switch to tape to disk, it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? Um, now, this wasn't in production for very long before the next model came along, which means they're quite hard to find. You're, you're looking at about, mm, about 150 to 200 pounds, if not more, to find one of these, uh, that's eBay prices. Um, and they all seem to have the same problem, which is the blue. Uh, if you look down deeper into the keys, you can see it's a much brighter blue. But these have really faded. I don't know if you could retro bright <laughs> those. Yeah, yeah, they were very vibrant blue, but yeah. unfortunately gone. And one other thing that Amstrad said about this machine was that it had uprated ergonomics over the 464. Indeed. Ergonomics. Well, wow. I mean, compared to the 464, which was a bit of a brick. Yeah, we've is... got an extra angle here. Indeed. <laughs> and the keys are, you know, slightly lower. Yeah. Um, so a bit more space. But software-wise, you would be pretty much running the same software uh, with the addition of CPM, which was, I think that was only disk-based, wasn't it? You couldn't load CPM from a tape. Correct. You, you had CPM on the disk. It came um, with the uh, 664. It also came with the uh, FD1 for the 464. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been CPM. I might be wrong. 2.2. 2.2. 2. 2. 2. 2. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that was to try and appeal a bit more to the business market. But there's a little sticky label over here that gives us a clue as to a mod that's been carried out. Indeed, the 664, as you've mentioned, wasn't out for long before the 6128 came along. Mm -hmm. uh, and that annoyed a lot of owners. Uh, and Amstrad refused to uh, produce the uh, firmware to buy to upgrade it. Uh, but somebody who owned this uh, has actually put the 6128 firmware into it and increased the RAM inside to 128K. So they've effectively done a conversion to a 128 uh, top of the range in 1985, that would have been, late 1985, Indeed. CPC 6128. The 6128 then, my 
dream machine in 1985. I couldn't afford this. I had I stuck with the 464 for quite a few years, but I would have loved one of these and I did eventually get one last year. I picked one up and we did a trash to treasure on the channel and it was really nice to work on it and, and finally have myself a 6128. Um, I really like this machine. Uh, have you got one yourself? Well, funny enough, I, this is mine. Oh, okay. This didn't come from the vault. <laughs> this one didn't come from the vault. Uh, they don't appear to have a 6128 in the museum, so I brought my one with me. And yes, it was my dream machine too, so uh, I had to expand my 464 up to this sort of machine. Um, but just generally, the, the whole sleekness of it compared to the 464, and even compared to the 664, it's so much slimmer. Yeah, yeah. Um, compatible, it's backwards compatible with the other machine's software. Um, again, I think we've got a tape port on here. Uh, no, we don't. It's on the it's on the side now. There it is. Yeah. Yes. So there is a tape port. So that's been moved around to the side. DB9 joystick port. Uh, on release around August 1985, the knock-on effect was the 464 was dropped 50 pounds. So you could that was still available in the shops. Mm -hmm. The 664, which had been released six months earlier or so, uh, that was dropped. So that was no longer for sale. That's why that's such a rarity. Uh, and this was the uh, the best of the best in the CPC range. Indeed, and it, and it doubly annoyed the 664 owners because it actually came out at cheaper than the 664 had been. Right, okay. A good 40 to 50 pound, depending on whether you went for the mono or, or color monitor. So you would have paid 299 pounds for the green screen, 399 mm -hmm. uh, for the color monitor. Again, with the 12 volt pass through for the disk drive. Um, if you pick one up now, you don't need these monitors. You can get a cable which will convert it to SCART, which is exactly what I did, and then just use it on a SCART uh, enabled television. And it works really well. Um, I can't notice the difference actually between the television and this monitor. Being Amstrad, these weren't, you know, these weren't premium monitors, were they? No, they were obviously uh, cheap, shall we say, cost effective tubes, um, and with the power supply doing both the computer and the monitor again that helped to keep costs down. Yeah, I remember with uh, Radio Shack and the TRS-80, they just relabeled televisions. Um, and that's probably, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what Amstrad did. Um, because uh, to Alan Sugar and to Amstrad, these were just another form of consumer electronic. It was mm. no different to a toaster or a kettle um, or the hi many hi-fis that Amstrad used to sell. And they weren't loyal to just the CPC range. They had their own IBM PC compatible range. They had their PCW word processor mm -hmm. range. So they had their fingers in a lot of computer pies. Um, but the one that really, yeah, it, it's the CPC range that's really Amstrad to me, um, just because of my own personal history with it. And they tried to drag this CPC range kicking and screaming into the 90s uh, pretty unsuccessfully, didn't they? With the next phase, if you like, of the CPCs, which is the plus range. And you've got an example of that next to you there. Right, I'm going to shuffle around here because there's not enough room for us <laughs> there. Um, we're into 1990 now. Amstrad decide it's time for a complete redesign of the CPC range. We're well into 16-bit territory with the Amiga, with the Atari ST. IBM PC compatibles are, are really gaining momentum. The CPC was starting to look a bit old and long in the tooth, wasn't it? Indeed, by 1989, I myself had sold most of the peripherals with my Amstrad to buy myself an Amiga. Uh, so I'd certainly jumped ship by then. Uh, but this was Amstrad's attempt at capturing some of the market that was going to the 16-bit machines. Mm -hmm. I'd done exactly the same. Sold my Amstrad so that I could afford uh, an Amiga 500 in 1989, I think it was. Yeah. So uh, the CPC then was a, was a forgotten memory for me, but Amstrad still wanted to push it. Uh, and you can see the influence that they've had in their design choices. It, it, it's got that sort of wedge shape of the Atari, of the Amiga. Uh, same color, they've switched to the cream color now. Um, very nice. This is the 6128 Plus. In fact, all, of all the Pluses, there was the 6128 Plus, <clears throat> there was the 464 Plus over here. Indeed. Unfortunately, this is an empty box. Um, there is a 464 Plus here somewhere. We there just must can't be. find it. There must be. Um, so there was that. And then we're going to cut to a, another shot now. There was the GX4000, which you can see here, which is essentially, uh, was it the 6128 or the 464 was that based on? It was based on pretty much the 464, but without the keyboard with the pause button mapped to just the P key. Um, but it was itself its own board because it had the uh, cartridge slot mm -hmm. on the top. Um, but the board inside the 6128 and the 464 was the same. It's just obviously this one had a few more components on the board 
to support the disk drive. Yeah, but the GX4000, I liken it very much to the Commodore GS game system where they took a Commodore 64, removed the keyboard, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, it had the same amount of success, which was literally zero. It, indeed, it was discounted down to just under £20 yeah. at the end just to shift the remaining stock. And I think they must have shifted a lot or they must have produced a lot because they're not hard to come by in, in the modern day. If you want to add one to your mm. collection, they're not difficult to find, at least here in the UK. So um, everyone I know who collects machines somewhere, they have a GX4000 tucked away. Um, they never take it out of the box, but they have it tucked away somewhere. Uh, but the more interesting ones for me are the 6128 Plus and the 464 Plus. Um, what they also incorporated into these beyond the CPC was enhanced graphics capabilities, enhanced sound capabilities. Mm -hmm. So there was a custom ASIC that they produced uh, that needed a special, I think, 17-byte code sent to the, uh, to the chip to unlock its capability. So this was so that old CPC software would work and wouldn't trip over the new features. Um, and that gave you, instead of... 27 colors, it expanded the color palette to 4096. So that was on par with the Amiga at that time. Uh, and it allowed more on screen because it gave you hardware sprites uh, and they themselves could have their own separate 15 color palette. Mm -hmm. You get the feeling from the design choice that they've pretty much given up on the business market with this range now. That was more the PCs and the PCWs. You only have to look at the box yeah. art and it's all about games. Yeah, yeah. so they've gone fully games and they've also incorporated into all the Plus models a cartridge um, slot. Uh, I think, yeah, burning rubber was the packing cartridge, wasn't it? Indeed, because on here as well is, is also the, um, of course, the firmware and the locomotive basic that would have been on a ROM chip inside the old ah. CPC. So to use uh, any of the old software, you would need that cartridge in and, and uh, enable the uh, locomotive basic. My personal memories are that these, uh, as lovely as they look, they did languish in the shops. I don't remember ever seeing anyone buy them. And in fact, you actually worked in an electrical store, didn't you? I where did. Where they would sold these. For, you could say for my sins, I did work in Dixon's for a number of years and uh, selling all sorts of different ones. So, uh, and when these came in, we were scratching our heads. We were selling the Atari ST, we were selling the Amiga 500, what was this? What? Why? Were you given any incentive to try and sell them by Amstrad? Oh, that's a very good question. I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. I don't okay. remember. And certainly my allegiance had shifted to the uh, Amiga, so I was certainly pushing the Amiga then. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, they didn't last long, but um, they would be nice to add to your collection. As an Amstrad collector, uh, I'd certainly like to get some pluses. Uh, the 664 is really the highest on my list because they come up so infrequently uh, and, and they are uh, obtainable, unlike the 472. That's, that's a whole exactly. other level. So um, for me, I would like to get the 664. Which of these would you like to get hold of for your collection? I, I would agree with you, the mm -hmm. 664. Um, I don't have one. I have a 464. I have a Plus now and the 6128. Yeah. So, uh, definitely a 664. It's funny, isn't it? It's not that it offers us anything that we can't already do on the other no, machines. it's because I have not. Because it's got blue keys and <laughs> <laughs> it's a slightly different shape. But hey, that's the nature of us uh, retro computer collectors, I guess. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our quick look at the Amstrad CPC range today. Keith, thank you for helping us to display these and to try them out and for bringing your own in. Um, you can't beat actually coming and using them in person, can you? It's all very well looking on a video, but it's a great opportunity if you're near or if you're traveling past Swindon to pop in to the Museum of Computing uh, and get hands on and try out 
the CPC range and all of the other machines that they've got. You'll see a bit of video edited in here of me walking around the museum. There's so much to try. Um, and the guys here, the volunteers here are super friendly, always happy to answer questions, people like Keith. And if you see anything around the museum that you'd like to see more of, then do leave a comment uh, and we'll pop back in and we'll do another show and tell for you. Until next time, thank you for watching and take care. Goodbye. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.